Hello, my name is Anthony Borelli, and this is the QC Podcast. The QC Pod features the people, projects, movements, and ideas that make up the Queens College community. To learn more, visit us at queenspodcastlab.org slash qcpod. On this episode of the QC Podcast, Nev Yakubov introduces us to the first episode of her new series, Raid or Die. Nev takes listeners on a journey through literary history and the battles that occurred along the way. In the first part of this two-episode premiere, Nev takes a look at a battle between two great Asian-American writers, Frank Chin and Maxine Hong Kingston, and a debate to figure out how to accurately write about Asian-American experiences. Welcome to Write or Die, the podcast where we navigate the spilled ink of epic battles staining the pages of literary history. I'm Nev Yakubov. This episode, we're focusing on two greats of Asian American literature, Frank Chin and Maxine Hong Kingston, and their disagreement about the right way to write Asian American literature. This is the first episode of a two-part series, with the first going through the history of the debate, and the second taking a close look at how their debate manifested in two of their works. At the end of this episode, make sure to take a listen to part two. If Frank Chin and Maxine Hong Kingston are the parents of Asian American literature, a title they both deserve, their marriage was anything but harmonious. They fought, sometimes viciously, but all over the same question. What is the right way? Or is there a right way to write Asian American literature? In order to understand how their debate came about, let's take a step back to the year 1940, the year that gave us both Frank Chin and Maxine Hong Kingston. Frank Chin was born on February 25th, 1940 to an immigrant father and a fourth-generation American mother. Despite being born in Berkeley, Chin spent much of his childhood in Oakland, Chinatown. Chin barely knew his parents. He later said, quote, I brought myself up. He began writing in junior high school and started taking college writing courses then. He attended the University of California at Berkeley, but graduated from Santa Barbara. He was a fighter, even then, claiming to have intimidated the dean of UC Santa Barbara into graduating him. See, he had taken a few years off, working as the first Chinese brakeman on the Southern Pacific Railroad track. Not wanting to waste any time, he came to the dean demanding a decision as to whether he had graduated by the following Friday. And he did, with a BA in English. That was 1965. In 1966, Chin moved to Seattle, Washington, and began working on documentaries and shows, including working as a story editor and scriptwriter for Sesame Street. During this time, Chin began gaining a small amount of popularity for his plays, and eventually founded the Asian American Theater Workshop, or the AATW, in 1973. Chin soon grew disappointed with the AATW. He felt that the plays it was producing were catered to white people instead of being authentically Asian. I founded the workshop, he writes, as the only Asian American theater that was conceived as a playwright's lab and not a showcase for yellows yearning to sell out to Hollywood. I failed. This sentiment of there being only one true way to create Asian American art, with all other versions labeled sellouts, is the same one that will later put him at odds with Maxine Hong Kingston. Chin's experience at the AATW soured his relationship with theater. He began writing novels, essays, and other fiction. He also began teaching workshops on Asian American history at colleges and high schools, where he saw it as his duty to protest against the quote, white racist characterization of Chinese fairy tales and childhood literature as teaching misogynistic ethics and despicable morals as fact." End quote. One of the Asian American writers that Chin viewed as most transgressive of this sin was Maxine Hong Kingston.
Maxine Hong Kingston was born on October 27, 1940, in Stockton, California, to two immigrant parents, Tom Hong and Chu Ying Lan. Her father was a scholar in China and her mother a doctor, but when they moved to the U.S., they ran a laundry and a gambling house. Kingston's childhood was a traditional one, following Confucian values. Kingston was quiet as a child and didn't speak English until the age of five. Like Chin, she began writing as a teenager, publishing an essay about being American in the magazine American Girl. As a girl, she remembers reading Louisa May Alcott's Eight Cousins, in which a white character marries a Chinese man named Fun Si. Fun Si is described as having yellow skin, long fingernails, and strange mannerisms. It was then that Kingston realized that she would never see herself properly represented in American literature. She says, quote, I felt like I was popped out of her writing, out of American literature, end quote. Maybe because of this disheartening memory, Kingston did not set out to become a writer. In 1958, she attended the University of California, Berkeley, for engineering. She switched her major to English, however, after getting swept up in the counterculture movement, where she says she felt heard. She graduated in 1962, the same year she married Earl Kingston, a fellow English major she had met a few years earlier. Her first son, Joseph, was born the following year. In 1964, Kingston studied to get a teaching certificate and started teaching at local high schools until she and her family moved to Hawaii in 1967. If Chin was a fighter, Kingston was definitely a pacifist. She had been involved in anti-war protests against the Vietnam War before her move to Hawaii, and after her move, she worked at a local church that helped soldiers who had gone AWOL. It was in Hawaii, too, that Kingston began writing the first of her books that Frank Chin would take offense to. The Woman Warrior, which first published in 1976. The Woman Warrior, which bears the subtitle A Girlhood Among Ghosts, combines retold traditional Chinese folklore with Kingston's own life, living somewhere in between memoir and fiction. Feminism was a big focus of Kingston's, and the Chinese folktales she retold often had a feminist spin to them. In an interview with Bill Moyers, she explained the changes she made to the original Mulan story. Fa Mulan came back from the battles against the Mongols, and, uh, and when she returned, um, she, she brought her army with her, and she asked them to wait outside. She, she came home. She went inside the house. She got out of her armor and, I guess, took a bath and put on her feminine clothes and she did her hair and she put flowers in it and then she presented herself to her army and she was a beautiful woman and she said I was the general that was leading you and they were just flabbergasted that it's a woman when I wrote that story I left that out because she says as a feminist I want to get rid of those that high heel shoes and the makeup and the, that that kind of stuff and um, and I, I wanted to show us women as being just as powerful as men. The Woman Warrior won the National Book Critics Circle Award, but Chin was not impressed. He thought Kingston was defaming traditional Chinese stories. At a 2008 event in Portland, Oregon, Chin tells over some traditional Chinese tales. He prefaces the event with the following. I will tell you enough stories that if you put them together, you cannot be fooled by phony stories. Like, if I told you one day Jack and the Beanstalk came across a green gob and he turned it into a girl, am I lying or am I telling the truth? Is that Jack and the Beanstalk? No, that's not Jack and the Beanstalk. Unfortunately, there are people that tell fake Chinese stories. 
Although he didn't name drop Kingston here, Chen has made it clear that he places her in the category of fake Chinese storyteller. In a 1991 interview with Frank Abe, Chin railed against Chinese-American authors for holding a double standard, saying, quote, They will protect white literature, but they don't care if Kingston violates the Ballad of Mulan. End quote. How exactly does he believe the Ballad of Mulan has been violated? In an essay entitled, Come All Ye Asian-American Writers of the Real and Fake, Chin scathingly writes, quote, in The Woman Warrior, Kingston takes a child to chant, The Ballad of Mulan, which is as popular today as London Bridge is Falling Down, and rewrites the heroine, Fa Mulan, to the specs of the stereotype of the Chinese woman as a pathological white supremacist, victimized and trapped in a hideous Chinese civilization." End quote. Chin also took offense to the feminist lens Kingston often put on her stories. About the woman warrior, he said, quote, She says the written Chinese character for woman and slave is the same word. Well, she's nuts. End quote. Kingston did not see herself as deforming the original Chinese tales, but she by no means intended them to be identical to the original stories. In an interview with Bill Moyers, she tells him, I don't invent uh, what was before. I invent the next stage. I go on. You can't help but wonder if, had Chin been less aggressive in his attacks of Kingston, perhaps a productive and intelligent conversation could have been had about Asian American literature. Chin was upset about the way Kingston misrepresented traditional Chinese tales, and later in her life, Kingston admits that she may have made a mistake leaving out some of the Mulan story. But now, with my being older, I, I look back and I think um, there are parts of that story that I left out on purpose, and maybe I shouldn't have left them out. The Chin Kingston debate is not just about Frank Chin and Maxine Hong Kingston, or even about Asian American literature. It's about art and whether there's a right way or a wrong way to produce it. It's about whose responsibility it is to represent the culture one is part of. It's about whether to use art as an expression of oneself or as a performance for a particular audience. Ultimately, society reveres the work of both Chin and Kingston, despite the choices that they made about their art. And although their metaphoric marriage was contentious, they undoubtedly deserve their roles as the parents of modern Asian American literature. This is the first episode in a two-part series. Make sure you listen to episode two, where we take a look at how Chin and Kingston's debate manifested in their versions of the Mulan story. Thank you for listening to Ride or Die. I'm Nev Yakubov. Our theme music is Mystery Unsolved by Shane Ivers, courtesy of Silverman Sound. Additional music is Depth of Focus, Swing Has Swung, Voyage of Discovery, It's Not Over Till the Bossa Nova, Breathe, Tomorrow's Times, and Imperial China Cinematic, all by Shane Ivers, courtesy of Silverman Sound. You can find all our sources at qwriting.qc.cuny.edu. Until next time! Nev will be back next week with the second part of Writer Dies premiere. That's all for today, though. Thanks for listening. Our theme music is Lake Monsters by John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants. QC Pod is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. To learn more, visit us at queenspodcastlab.org slash QCPod.